So here what I've shown is, uh, okay, our objective is to be able to control the optical properties of quantum dots so they absorb light from the peak wavelength of 850 nanometers to roughly 1500 nanometers. In this manner, we can cover the solar spectrum. So we're using properties of nucleation and growth to do this. Keep in mind that both nucleation and growth are proportional to temperature. And also keep in mind that it's quite easy to grow large nanocrystals, but we found that the challenge is to push the crystals to be smaller and smaller sizes. We also want to keep in mind that um, you want a fast nucleation rate, so you have all the particles being nucleated at the same time, so this uh, makes a very narrow size distribution, which is desirable. So we want a high temperature to induce nucleation very quickly, but the growth stages after nucleation are also temperature dependent because you thoroughly activate a process of diffusion to the particle and reacting with the particle surface. So it's a balance between decreasing the temperature to induce nucleation to get small, uh, narrow size range and reducing the temperature so you don't have the particles growing too fast and becoming larger than as desired. Because in these particles, as I showed in the very first slide, the size and the optical properties are one related. You can't separate them. So what we found actually is that the best, the best procedure to make particles is to have a maximum injection temperature, maximum initial temperature, and then cool them off, cool them as fast as possible. So by doing this method, by doing this approach, we can create particles that are about 2.7 nanometers and absorb at 850 nanometers, which is, again, depends on your choice of Except for material, but this is what we want. So I've shown you that we can grow lead sulfide nanoparticles. I've shown you that we can control the size of them. But this tells us nothing about the quantum efficiency. It tells us nothing about the, the quality of these particles. So quantum efficiency is the, the ratio of emitted light to absorbed light. In the highest it can be is one, which represents for every photon that's being absorbed, particle will emit a photon. And the processes that reduce this figure are non-radiated recombinations, which is, means that there's some kind of defect or some kind of pathway in which the absorbed energy from the photons is being relaxed in a mechanism that does not emit light. So you're basically wasting energy. But um, if, this, if this quantum efficiency is very low, it represents uh, wasted energy. The light is being absorbed in it and ultimately turns to heat. So to perform the quantum efficiency measurements, we have to measure the total light emitted from our samples with respect to the quantum efficiency of a, a known material, which we use the dye IR125. So we, we performed a systematic study to varying source chemicals with the goal of reducing defects that are probable, path, probable causes or probable mechanisms for non-reated recombinations that are hurting our quantum efficiency. So here we have, um, this, the, the, the plots here are photo emission, photo luminescence spectra, which is measuring the light emitted by these five particles as a function of the chemicals we use to synthesize them. So in the process involving lead oxide as the starting source of lead precursor, we actually are in introducing water in the system, which we know to be detrimental to quantum efficiency. So we thought that we could remove the water from the system by changing the lead source with, to something called lead acetate. And we also changed the solvent in which the growth process um, occurs in with, a, with the goal of reducing the defects that are um, introduced into the particles. What we found is that the quantum efficiency is largely independent of the solvent used. If we try to change the lead precursor, um, you notice that this is a redshift. So even though the same growth procedure resulted in, in larger particles, so if we try to change the lead source, we actually reduce the nucleation rate. We can't even make the particles as small as we like. But um, we have, in fact, achieved particles that emit at 66% quantum efficiency, which is actually very good compared to the literature. And the most important factor we actually saw is that if you 
follow the recipes from the literature and you um, expose them to the post synthesis process with methanol, you can essentially quench the quantum efficiency. So what that means is that the, the, the graph here in the pink and the graph here in the blue represent particles that are synthesized in the same manner, but just have been exposed to different chemicals post growth and we reduce the quantum efficiency by threefold. So this is a very delicate mechanism and if you expose it to the wrong chemical, you can you kill it. So I've shown you that we can create efficient lead sulfide nanoparticles with the size that we desire, with high quantum efficiency. So now we're working on two different things. We're working on reducing the distance between the lead particle, the lead sulfide nanoparticle and the transport channel. Because in the first equation that I showed, it's um, inversely proportional to the distance to the power four or inversely proportional to the distance to the power four for quantum dot to a two-dimensional channel. So we're trying to exchange the, the ligand, the capping agent that is intrinsically built onto these particles with something that's even one nanometer shorter where you can enhance the threat by a factor of four. And also, we're working to measure the current that's created in the transport channel that has been induced by this mechanism. So this is the, the, the first goal we have, is to actually measure the current induced by this means. So finally, to summarize, our approach to quantum dot-based solar energy conversion utilizes non-resonant, non-radiative energy transfer to overcome limitations in transport of charges absorbed from light. We can control the growth of the nanoparticles to absorb strongly anyway from 850 nanometers <coughs> to 1500 nanometers and above to match our choice of transport channel material. And we can create lead sulfide nanoparticles with quantum efficiencies up to 66%. So finally, I'd just like to thank my advisor, Dr. Madugar. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Siwan Lu, who's helped me out in with this. He's here somewhere. Our undergraduate, Daniel, who's been a big help in the lab. And my other groupmates, Tetsuya and Yanai, for helping me write the presentation.
and literature reports that you do this by um, precipitating out your particles with ethanol in order to separate them from the other excess reactants. 